When my grandmother was born in the 1920s, there were perhaps two billion people on Earth. When my mother was born, that number had increased to 2.8. United Nations predicts that by the time I am my mother's age, there will be 9.7 billion people on Earth, and 68% of them will live in the organizational structures that we call cities. All of human history, all of civilization, every city ever built, indeed even agriculture, has been established in a narrow band of favorable climatic conditions called the Holocene Epoch. But anthropogenic climate change is threatening to alter irreversibly this narrow band of favorable rainfall and temperatures. And as it does so, it is exposing a tangle of infrastructural and design problems that centuries of haphazard planning have left behind. Cities are going to be forced to be either reactive or proactive to the harmful impacts of climate change. Which will they choose? Whatever they choose, how will they do it without exacerbating systemic inequities? And where are they going to find the time and resources to do that important work? I'm here to tell you some good news about the work being done in Richmond, Indiana, and in the Midwest to answer some of those questions. But before I begin, I want to back up a little bit and explain to you how I came to have a unique perspective on this matter. I graduated from the Ohio State University in 2016 with a natural resource management degree. After I did, I worked a couple of seasons at different organic farms, I did some environmental contracting work, but my real introduction to sustainability came when I began doing food waste composting in late 2017. I helped set up commercial composting operations at many different organizations, but it was my interactions with local governments in Southwest and in Central Ohio that really sparked my passion for public service. The reason was those clients wanted to introduce composting services to their municipal solid waste management, not only for the economic and environmental benefits of doing so, but to give their residents pride that they lived somewhere that would offer such a service. I knew I wanted to join the public service field and do this important work on behalf of the people, but needed a change to get there. This led to me in the summer of 2020, enrolling in the Masters of Environmental Sustainability program at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University, where I would study municipal sustainability. Around the same time, I began work under Dr. Aaron DeLott as a graduate research assistant at the Metropolitan Governance and Management Transitions Lab. And in short, I spent the next year intensively studying cities, how they work, how they're managed, and how we think we can manage them to work more sustainably. There's no shortage of work to be done here, and no one person could know all there is to know on this complex and evolving topic, which is part of why I'm talking to you today. Now, I'm the Geographic Information Systems Coordinator at the City of Richmond, Indiana, in the Department of Infrastructure and Development. I help answer spatial questions to aid in decision making and make mapping resources to make Richmond a nicer place to live. I'm staff chair, vice chair of and staff liaison to the Richmond Environmental Sustainability Commission. And I oversee many of the sustainability projects in the city. Now, I'm not here to belabor the existence of climate change, nor am I here to admonish society for not doing more to limit our emissions. Because the thing is this, howsoever our aspirations go to mitigate those most harmful impacts of climate change, those changes are already here. They are impacting our cities now, and they need to be managed. And furthermore, because the majority of lived experiences this century and beyond will be had by regular folk just trying to live ordinary lives in cities, the totality of human suffering due to climate change this century and beyond could be expressed as a function of how well cities manage to adapt to climate change. I want to talk to you today about the resources cities use to do this adaptation. Now, some have more or less of them than others, but that important work is being done to bridge the gaps between what cities are capable of and what they can achieve. But in the end, the most important work must be done by local practitioners embedded in and devoted to their local communities. 
Let me start by talking about capacities. You can think of capacities as the managerial resources required to get something done. I'm going to describe four different kinds, and as I do, I invite you to think about your own team, your own project, and how something may have succeeded or failed because it could or couldn't maintain the right balance of these capacities. You have technical capacity, which is the raw know-how to turn information into results. You've got administrative capacity, which is the ability to lead and manage projects. You have political capacity, which is the reality of on-the-ground decision-makers and policy setters to green light, support, and continue supporting a project. And of course, you have fiscal or financial capacity, which is the ability to pay for it all. Now, if cities are already struggling as is in many cases, simply to provide traditional city services, how are they going to find the capacity to adapt to climate change? The shortfalls of capacity for sustainability in local governments is well known. Some larger cities have the correct balance of fiscal and political capacity to hire full-time sustainability staff who bring with them the administrative and technical capacities for sustainability projects. Many smaller cities, though, don't have this balance. And if they do address climate change at all, often do so by placing additional responsibilities onto the shoulders of existing staff who may or may not have the proper balance of capacities to adequately take on those projects. Compounding this issue for smaller cities is the fact that the administrative capacities that sustainability staff bring are often positively associated with fiscal capacities. Because if you're doing that work, if you're doing sustainability work, you will find grant monies to help support that, your own position and the different programs capable of being run. Another complication is the fact that it's often far more expensive to rebuild after disaster than to build resiliency f beforehand. And of course, the loss of human life from climate disaster is irreplaceable. Luckily, there's important work being done here in this state that I want to tell you about. And the work is to help local governments address those capacity gaps and build resilience. Foremost amongst the organizations in my experience doing this important work is called the Environmental Resilience Institute from Indiana University. The Environmental Resilience Institute is an organization that helps local governments understand how climate change impacts them. They provide tailored tools, resources, and information to help local practitioners prepare their communities. One of the ways they do this is through the Resilience Cohort. Richmond, Indiana joined the first Resilience Cohort in 2019 joining 13 other Indiana communities on a track towards conducting a greenhouse gas inventory to understand our emissions, drafting a climate action plan, and many other sustainability-related projects. And the cohort is that peer of communities that we network with, receive resources from ERI together with, and learn how to do this work with. Another important resource from ERI is called the Hoosier Resilience Index Readiness Assessment. The readiness assessment takes the form of a survey that we here in Richmond administered out to officials in our city and in Wayne County where we stand, well versed in our built environment, our infrastructure and utilities, our agriculture and our food systems, our emergency preparedness, our public health and more, saying, on a detailed list from one to five, how prepared are you for the effects of extreme heat? What about extreme precipitation? What about flooding events? The Environmental Resilience Institute takes and compiles those responses into an index that we can see from our community how we compare to peer-sized communities in Indiana and Indiana's communities at large. They also create the Next Steps for Climate Resilience in Richmond, Indiana document, which we utilized in our climate action planning team as the very foundation of the climate adaptation strategies in our climate action plan. What this allowed is for us to have a far more robust and comprehensive set of responses than we otherwise could have achieved without this assistance from ERI. Now that's a lot of academic speak, but what does it feel like to be working in local government and get this kind of assistance from organizations like that? We in the city are trying to keep your roads paved, your trash collected, 
the water flowing into and out of your homes, your neighborhoods safe, the opportunities and economic development growing, and climate change. Climate change is scary. It's complicated. And it's something else we have to manage too. Organizations that help local governments build capacity for sustainability, they come in and they say, hey, we got you. Your capacity shortfalls aren't unique. Cities all around the world are trying to figure out how to do this important work. Here are your peers in the resilience cohorts. Here are tools and resources to help you do the work. Here are climate fellows, funded interns, that we can provide and embed in your community to give you the capacity to do this work. Let's get started together. Now, whether or not we receive this type of technical or administrative capacity from organizations like that, or if we receive financing from state or federal allocations of funding, which is also needed for sustainability projects, it won't do us much good if we don't understand how to effectively allocate them into our communities. And as such, proximity is the key to effective implementation. I want to tell you about one program in Richmond that demonstrates this. But first, can anybody tell me what the deadliest weather phenomenon in the United States is? Is it tornadoes? Hurricanes? It, it's actually heat. It's when it gets too dang old hot. The number of extreme heat events in Wayne County, Indiana, where we stand today, by the 2050s, in a medium emission scenario, you can think of an extreme heat event as when it's hot during the day and it stays hot overnight and your body just can't cool down. The number of extreme heat events by the 2050s is projected to triple or more. What does this mean for our community? What would that mean for your community? What does this mean for our public spaces and our infrastructure? And most importantly, what does this mean for our most vulnerable residents? The Indiana University's Environmental Resilience Institute and the Indiana Office of Community and Rural Affairs put together a two-year grant-funded program called Beat the Heat to help answer those questions. Beat the Heat aims to develop a heat relief strategy for the community. The Richmond's Environmental Sustainability Commission applied to be one of the communities with a Beat the Heat program embedded in it. And in July of 2021, Lucy Mellon became the City of Richmond's Heat Relief Coordinator in the Department of Infrastructure and Development. The Heat Relief Coordinator receives programmatic direction and support from ERI and departmental supervision from myself. So what this means is that Little Richmond, Indiana, now punches far above its weight, joining only a handful of communities in the whole world in the United States, with full-time resiliency staff dedicated to addressing the impacts of extreme heat. The Heat Relief Coordinator does this by hosting focus groups, public surveys, and more. We have a heat relief task force with members from disadvantaged communities, outdoor workers, a city council person, public health officials, emergency management officials, and more, who all cue her in on creating the most contextually appropriate and effective strategy for what our community specifically can do about the problem of, of extreme heat. Because we share an office, the heat relief coordinator looked over at me one day and she said, Grayson, I just talked with the resident. They're a single parent living near the poverty line with a chronic illness. And they told me that every day of the summer is a battle against the heat that defines their experience. They said they felt they were suffering in silence for so long, but that finally their city was paying attention to them. We cannot lose sight of the fact that the work of local governance is the work of improving the lived experiences of our residents. And sustainability and climate adaptation is exactly that. Whether or not we receive technical and administrative capacities or financial capacities or political capacity, if we don't know how to effectively allocate those resources into our communities in science-backed, results-oriented, means-tested ways, it won't matter. It will take a whole-of-society approach to provide peace, justice, 
predictability and stability to the world's residents, even in the absence of climate destabilization. But with it, the need for smart, talented, and collaborative individuals to engage in local governance is all the more important. We must be embedded in these communities to understand them, to hear them and listen to them, to be able to address their needs. I knew I wanted to do my share of this complicated work all of my life, and I came to it through a roundabout path from agriculture to food waste composting, municipal solid waste management, to geographic information systems and sustainability project management with many odd jobs in between. But I want you to understand one thing. Whether you find yourself building or wielding capacity for sustainability in local government, it is an act of compassion for present and all future generations. Thank you.